So, um, Craig Trapanch, welcome. Indeed. Thank you, Chris, and thank welcome you for the book. thank you for the invite and the opportunity. Scary yeah, times so, we live in. <laughs> and you're coming in from South Africa. Yeah, proudly so, South African. Yeah. Proudly South African. I'm, I'm proudly half American, half half Dutch. Confused. Um, and it's almost winter there, so it I is winter. Your scarf. It, it is winter. Pretty, it's been frozen for the pretty, last week or pretty, so. Pretty, pretty chilly. Yeah, pretty yeah. chilly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's go for it. We've got an hour to get awakened um, about exponential organizations and exponential possibilities. So. I'll keep myself here nearby. Um, yeah. I will see if I can find in, you know, figure out how to see any um, um, chats along the way. And so I might pop in and, and uh, let you know if there's any questions coming. So there is, you know, this is an invite for people. If you can chat um, um, in the live comments, in the live comments, but, but you can't see it on, on their side, but um, maybe you're seeing the live comments. And uh, let's have a good time. So, so Craig, take it from here. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks again. And as I said, thank you so much for for the opportunity. Um, and I really like the term that you used there, Chris. Uh, exponential opportunities, because I think that's really what it's about. You know. So, um, this this is not a standard awake session format but uh, so i've weaved in a few different things just to give it some some variety and really show show some of the possibilities and we'll go through quite a few slides but quite quickly in a kind of a conversational mode so i'm, I'm really open to the live comments and uh, chris if you see any of them that you think we should chat about a little bit let's let's by all means do that um, but the format is is pretty much you know technology and exponential technology um, societal and business implications and then what do these exponential organizations look like um, and how might a norm a standard traditional organization transform exponentially and then how could you get help from the OpenXO community and even get certified um, as, a, as an exponential organization? So really the hypothesis is that disruption changes everything. Um, and really that markets are transforming and note the image of COVID. We've, we've seen dramatic transformation uh, un, un, unexpectedly. Businesses are transforming, offerings work, <clears throat> the, the speed at which services need to be offered and work needs to be done, and actually even the speed of demand is transforming, and this even requires finance to, to transform. So I'll weave in these transformation elements into the, into the discussion as we, as we progress. But let's start with the, the technology and overused 4IR um, issue. So the information age, although it lasted just a few decades, what's interesting with this curve is, and this is the information age curve, um, is that you can see for the first 30 to 40 years, it was pretty flat. And that is pretty um, much what happens with disruptive technology is it, it's initially quite deceptive. And then it goes exponential, as you can see on this curve. Um, and although it's flattened here, I think there's another S curve coming. So, you know, and if you think about the, the incredibly slow progression over many years from hunter gatherer to the agricultural age to the industrial age, you know, to probably this was more data processing initially, and then, you know, the digital age, um, it sped up and it's going to keep speeding up. And then to weave in just a different perspective, um, ARK Invest has done quite a bit of research on innovation platforms and their underlying technologies. So, so I've weaved that in as well, just to give us um, a different perspective. And I'll share the, the slides afterwards on, on the YouTube channel. So you'll be able to go in and actually watch these videos. We, we're not able to play the videos in this, in this stream. 
and it's not necessary, but there are quite a few videos along the way um, that, that one can go and have a look at afterwards. So in ARK Invest's 2019 Big Ideas report, um, you'll see that they created this, this curve, which is really, uh, and this graphic, which is really quite a nice way of looking at, um, you know, the, the impact of technology through the various industrial revolutions, so first, second, third, and, you know, how computers and the internet, and you can see this pretty much matches that information age graph. But look at what happens here now with what ARK Invest call the, the um, innovation platforms and, and their impact on economic activity. So you've got some of the usual suspects, artificial intelligence, energy storage, robotics, genome sequencing, and blockchain technology. Um, and what's interesting about these is that they're all having an impact at the same time. So, you know, talk about exponentialities. And of course, initially they were deceptive, but look at how they've actually accelerated and starting to have a massive impact. So if we, sorry, I'm trying to move slides. Um, and if we look at what's, you know, and from our Invest point of view, they're looking at the, the, the investability of these innovation platforms. But if you look at the factors that, 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 that we need to keep in mind. So firstly, there's the cost curve that declines. ARK Invest um, refers to rights law, which is about declining cost curves as the efficiencies increase and the, the cost of production decreases. Um, so there's those cost efficiencies. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, um, has, has, has his own perspective on this. He's, he talks about the price performance improving. So it's kind of the opposite curve, but it's price performance rather than uh, um, declining costs. And, and of course, there's a tipping point in these things. And that tipping point affects what happens where uh, these technologies start to affect multiple industries and, and start to actually go exponential as well. So this is just an example of how electricity over time started to affect multi multiple industries. And in the, in the previous slide, we touched on, on battery technology. Um, and, and what's interesting to see here is how battery technology, you know, it, it probably first had an impact on mobile and telephony, you know, with mobile telephony. And of course, now it's having a massive impact on transport, robotics and and various other things so keep in mind um, how these things are cross industry cross technology and and actually at the intersection of the opportunity with these with these technologies so arc investors come out with their big ideas 2020 and i'm going to i'm going to talk to some of these um, deep learning is particularly interesting um, we i've just touched on electric vehicles i've talked to that a little bit more I mean, the interesting thing there is that is um, what what where Elon Musk is really he he's now saying that this year he'll be able to deliver a fully autonomous vehicle, so 100% autonomous, um, and the reason that he's able to do that is because of the data that he's collected. So you know, it's not just about the the battery technology, but it's also about the the, the uh, the deep learning that is happening with the data. Automation has been on the on the on the cards for, for many years now, but it's going to another level. It's going to advance automation with artificial intelligence as part of the automation. 3D printing is interesting. I've got a few slides on that coming up. Um, I spoke about autonomous ride hailing. So so Elon's plan is to for you to buy an autonomous vehicle that you rent out to ride hailers and there's a massive return on investment on that on that purchase of the of the uh, autonomous vehicle so you actually end up having a vehicle for free that other people rent from you ultimately drones are are, are interesting i mean um you know to the extent that if you think about the price performance and the capacity of drones you know amazon is now looking at being able to deliver Bigger and bigger packages for under a dollar. It's it's incredible how how the how the price performance has increased. 
but it's also gone to capacity and scale. So there's been experiments of people being able to, uh, so, uh, sorry, not people, organizations, corporates being able to take shipping containers from the shipping vehicle and place them on the shore. So that's the extent to which uh, drones are becoming uh, 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 viable. And imagine the cost efficiencies of that in terms of not having to build a, um, a port, for example, to deliver, to deliver a container. DNA sequencing, DNA sequencing is incredible. Um, you know, it's top of mind and, and the health care developments are, are amazing that, are, that, are, that, are, that we're seeing with, with the ability to DNA sequence for what used to cost millions of dollars now under, under a dollar. And I'll talk about digital wallets later uh, and a bit more on Bitcoin later as well. So, um, sorry, I think what's happened here? Sure. That's weird. Sorry. Hey, Go on, hey Craig, while you're fixing that up. Yeah. Um, it was interesting that, that you asked or, or, or you called it the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. And I know in the exponential communication, Sometimes that, mm. those terms are challenged because it's neither yeah, yeah, industrial yeah, yeah, nor yeah, a revolution. Yeah, yeah that's it's that's why. About. Yeah. So what, what what is your what is your word for that, or what's your your description for what's actually you know how, how do you summarize all of those just mind boggling? Yeah, well, you know, Tony Sildana calls it the the, the ex exponential five. So uh, I don't know if if and, and and the point is that it's not just. It's combinations of technology, you know, so if you think of, of robotics and automation, they, they're, they're intersecting and they're working together. Um, so, you know, 4RR kind of almost underplays it. It's more about the exponentiality, the price performance, uh, the, the cross-market opportunities, etc. So I can't get this. This video was, uh, was hidden behind the graphic and I don't know why it's now appeared there. But the point is that... Um, Sorry, Chris, is that... Uh, yeah, go for it, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so the point is, you'll see a linear curve here. Ignore the video, it's supposed to, it's not supposed to be there. For some reason, it uh, popped uh, behind the slide. Um, the point is that these curves are, are, are deceptive and, and, and people expect linear disruption or linear change until actually they break through the point where um, as we've seen with COVID, you know, unprecedented speed of the collapse of the markets in March, unprecedented global uh, pandemic with extraordinary economic and social impact, and then the resources that were deployed, and unprecedented response from governments and from you know to find medical solutions, and um, and then the stimulus from governments in the economy, and suddenly then. Um, an unprecedented recovery in the markets in April and May. So COVID has really given us a, a good illustration of uh, exponential possibility, I, I believe. So let's go into some of the implications on society and business. You know, if, we, if we think back uh, through the phases of development, um, you know, from, from a cultural and, and human change perspective, you know, we unionized, uh, we nationalized, and, and actually now we, we're heading to more, more, more towards tribes. So during the unions, it was more about workers and factories and office automation. Um, and of course, from about 2000, you know, robotics, robo-advisors, virtual assistants. And, and along came uh, Yuval Harari, who I watch with keen interest, and uh, I recommend you do if you haven't. So he wrote these two books, Sapiens showed us where we came from and Homodeus shows us where we're going. And the interesting thing about Homodeus is um, that, you know, as cyborg, cyborgs, <clears throat> we could be completely enslaved by technology as the human computer interfaces move from keyboard to voice to brainwave interface, which has already been tested and working and which are already, uh, you know, in the, in the labs. Um, and, and we get to this phase where AI and machine learning takes us to being digital cyborgs. Um, and, and this is the, the, the hypothesis and, in fact, the very convincing story that Harry Yuval tells in, in Homo Deus. As we, as we collectively become tribes, some people will embrace this stuff 
and others will reject it as you know the the, the end of the world kind of uh, conspiracy. So what's very important with with uh, where we, where we're going as humanity is is to follow guys like Gerd Leonard, who is considering the ethics of AI and human cyborgs, cyborgs. He's a leader in this space, and he says that the future is already here. You know, and you can ask musicians, publishers, car makers, doctors, lawyers, and accountants. They they will uh, they will agree already. And of course, you know, the financial institutions are uh, kind of in denial in many respects. Um, but human-only work will become the, as valuable as, as it cannot be automated. So human critical thinking, ethics, creativity, you know, these things that cannot be digitized, they'll become increasingly valuable. But of course, on the horizon is the singularity, which we believe is about a decade, a decade away. And um, technology will remain a tool, not a purpose. So. Humanity needs to stick with and, and understand and embrace purpose. So in terms of the singularity, um, <clears throat> what's, what's being, what's being, uh, ex what's expected is that through exponential technologies, we're, we're, we're the, the insect brain came about in around 2001, the mouse brain around 2010. So we're beyond the mouse brain, full human brain by 2020. So Computing power already provides the ability, the capability of a full human brain. And we've seen this with some of the, you know, computer, uh, computers beating chess, beating Jeopardy and the likes. Um, computers can now outsmart humans in many respects. But human collective brain power, which is the point at which we reach the singularity, used to be predicted at about 2050 and it's believed that it's now going to be as soon as 2040 so interesting times and again don't watch the watch the videos in your own time on the on the youtube channel um so and and one of the biggest issues is that people change slowly you know this technology is increasingly exponential it, it is it is having an exponential impact on industries on on change on businesses and yet traditional organizations change at a log logarithmic rate, rate and this gap is what's called mertax law people's inability to keep up so we better get with the program in terms of purpose and and in terms of the transformation of business computing so let's look at some of the phases here you know we've moved way beyond construction projects hardware and infrastructure and the data processing kind of phase and um, even beyond, you know, from the 2000s, it was more about applications and packages and processes, more sort of customization projects. So information technology and communications, traditional. And we're now really in the phase of capabilities and continuous adaptation. And we'll go into the XO model a bit later to see how that is uh, possible and what, what that means. And really platform services and people. So. You know, you know, and the and the platforms are not are nothing without the people, without the tribe, without the community, and without the engagement that goes with them. So, digital business and digital ecosystems is the way of the of the future. And these, sorry, I'm jumping around. Um, th these technologies really begin to work when the integrative nature of a ecosystem marketplace is evident and and creates that exponential transformation. So. Google is a simple example of, of ecosystem-based business models. You know, you've got the Google search capability, but around it, you've got a whole ecosystem of businesses. You know, you've got the Play Store where um, you can either be a gamer and create games, or you can be a consumer and consume games, or you can be an app developer and you can build some value exchange with this ecosystem that you put on uh, on on the App Store. You've got the, the storage capability with the, the likes of Google Drive. You know, you've got the location-based capabilities, and these all integrate. You, you, you know, location-based services give you the ability to, to personalize things a lot more. And, of course, you know, when, when Google started giving away free email, I often wondered what their strategy was, and it's become increasingly obvious. So that's uh, a typical ecosystem business model. 
Um, so, so this is all contributing to the transformation of markets. And I'll, I'll clarify a little bit what I mean by from brand to democratized. Um, and from national to tribes, we've already touched a little bit on tribes. And then from regulated to self-regulating. Now, So you've seen the self-regulating um, Uber kind of example, you know, the drivers that get the best ratings get the best offers in terms of the, the next customer to serve. The, the other nice self-regulating example is on GitHub. If you're a developer and your ratings are high on GitHub, you can ask for higher, higher rates in terms of payment. Um, the example in terms of tribes, you know, the, the, the most obvious one is, is the Apple fanboys. Everybody that's got an Apple is, is part of a tribe and, and typically has all the Apple devices integrated and working together. Um, and, you know, increasingly with work from home and working anywhere, the, the global connections that you have allow you to actually be part of a tribe. So let's look at this democratized thing a little bit more in the next slide. Yeah, the, the nature of disruption is such that um, initially when you digitize, it's it's actually deceptive as we've as we've already touched on, but then it begins to disrupt and it begins to demonetize because as we've said with um, Kurzweil's price performance and rights law, as the cost comes down, these things get cheaper and cheaper and, and, and therefore um, almost become free eventually. And this makes it more increasingly uh, accessible. So, so that's where the demonetization comes in. And so if we think about digital wallets, you know, micropayments will enable entirely new business models to appear in established industries. And platform businesses enable value exchange across a border ecosystem underpinned by digital wallets. So, so digital wallets aren't just a... a you know, another a gateway to financial services. They're actually creating frictionless, frictionless access in future to um, a financial inclusion, and ultimately that'll be increasingly that'll be through through cryptocurrencies. Uh, so we're witnessing the rise of an alternate financial system. Whether it ends up actually being Bitcoin is debatable, but uh, Kathy Woods, Ark Invest, believes it will be Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not going to go into that debate, but it's certainly on the horizon. This is interesting for me. So China, uh, while the U.S. created the Internet economy, China could spearhead the AI economy because they have no privacy risk. <laughs> uh, they, they're they fantastic in semiconductor and AI chip design. They, they've got, you know, they're using AI extensively already. They actually have a national mandate. Um, to become a leader in AI. And of course, they've got a huge internet, internet population to, to test this with. So I have no doubt, um, you know, we, we've spoken about the transformation of markets. We're, we better transform our offers based on customer value attribution. So we have to go from, as corporates, what we have to what customers want. And from self-serving, you know, Corporates are often serving from the inside. We've got a whole lot of stuff, and you, Mr. Customer, must take it. But we need to go to what is the customer value that we're trying to attribute, and from generalized to highly personalized. So to 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 give you an example, there's a little video of uh, Tilly Lockley's 3D printed removable robot robotic arms that she controls with the thoughts that that um, create the muscle movements in the end of her stubs. She's she's only got stubs. She had polio as a child. But she's got these amazing robotic arms that she can actually control with her mind by, by getting her muscles to twitch and the sensors in her robotic arm um, allow the, the movement to happen. So that's an example of hyper-personalization. It's, it's in the physical realm, but uh, in the digital realm, hyper-personalization is even easier. And then I love this uh, MX 3D printed bridges. They happen to be an, a, a Dutch company. Um, the last time I was in Amsterdam, I went looking for for some of these bridges, and I couldn't find any. But uh, <laughs> they, the, the company certainly exists, and uh, the robotic arms are, are printing 3D bridges. So amazing stuff as to as to what you know what can happen. 
And, and you know, the thing is that with distributed ledgers, we'll be able to enhance the efficiency of offers and the value exchange will be based on customer value attribution. So we'll really be able to make the service immutable and secure uh, through, through blockchain. <clears throat> and every industry is affected by blockchain. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but, you know, smart contracts is a, is a pretty obvious one. In fact, in the Dutch courts, a lot of the simple cases are being processed through AI and, and, and actually court rulings and, and uh, uh, judgments being processed through AI and passed down through AI. And, and I'm not sure if it's happening in other countries. I just I happen to know about the technology in the Dutch courts. Um, supply chain, I, I mean, we, we, we're busy looking at um, for food distribution to you know, poor households that are highly impacted by this current pandemic, how we can create an impact chain that makes sure that the, the funders and the contributors uh, can see the, the outcome of the, 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 the uh, impact fund that they, that they invest into a marketplace so that the, um, we know that the right people are getting the food for the right reasons. So that's just two examples there. Um, not going to... Hey, Craig, yeah. um, we have a question coming in from mm. Zell. Um, so it might have been a bit ago, but I think it's a nice question. And the question is, how we, will we deal with the unpredictable behavior of the humans, mm -hmm. um, i.e. the reaction we saw with COVID? Meaning, the way I interpret that, got me thinking, is like, well, when we are confronted by this, how do you think people will, will respond mm. collectively in, in maybe yeah. predictable or unpredictable ways? I was Good trying question. to see which I was trying to see which slide she was uh, possibly referring to. But I mean I, well, I, I guess I guess it's about mindset. So we, we are coming a bit we're coming a bit later to the, the concept of mass, massive transformative purpose. And um, um, you know the so you you People's initial reaction is fear, you know, uncertainty and doubt. Um, but with the right mindset, we can we can help them to um, understand the ethics of AI. You know, go on the right path in terms of making the decision to become a cyborg or not, etc. It's all about mindset, I, I believe. Well, I also I also think um, that AI will slowly creep into our lives as opposed to suddenly you know yeah. have a sky yeah. cyborg overlord sure. um sure. we might end up that way because you know the, the the pot you know slowly boiling and we don't notice it but uh um because you know, there's already you know like like siri and and you know all, all mm. of these other helpful tools it's already in our life absolutely and uh, and some people choose not to check in and other people adopt it totally so so cool yeah. cool yeah. question Lizelle. thank you yeah, absolutely. Um, again, this is just a video which expands on on some of these points about which industry and and how it's really affecting every every industry uh, blockchain. But interestingly, you know, and when when I first presented this transformation of work, it was well before COVID, but now it's making so much more sense. So, you know, the shift really from deliverables to out outcomes, uh, you know, the focus on, on the product outcome that you're trying to deliver and the shift to autonomy. I mean, I, I think um, COVID has done us a bit of a favor in that regard because you really need to have to, we have to trust people um, to, to deliver on an outcome in an autonomous way without, um, you know, hierarchical structures and command and control uh, meetings forever going on. So. But the interesting thing about the transformation of work is if we go back to, to deep learning, now deep learning software um, is inspired by the human brain and machines that, that, that are, you know, deep learning machines don't need programmers to tell them what to do because they use the data to train themselves. So if you think about the implications of that, you know, you've heard the concept uh, and the term software is eating the world, but deep learning takes this to another level. 
And in fact, it's through deep learning that um, autonomous driving and, and Elon Musk's Tesla success has, has really accelerated. So it, just think about it. It's almost impossible for hundreds or th you know, however many thousands of programmers to code for every uh, possibility of what a car might encounter as an autonomous vehicle. How would you do that? You know, where would you start? How would you make the decisions around what's ethical? ethical? Do you kill the driver or do you kill the, uh, um, the pedestrian? Uh, it's, it's impossible. But with the data that, that, that Tesla has gathered and the deep learning uh, capabilities that they have, they've almost reached autonomous driving. It's not, but it's not with hundreds of programmers. And uh, I, I think there's a big wake up call coming to the, uh, to the programming industry as this starts to penetrate more and more industries in terms of, um, you know, things like accounting and, and auditing and the legal profession. Deep learning is going to be the software that, that eats the world and, and, and takes away those jobs, but creates lots of opportunities for other jobs. Was there a question, Chris? There was, Greg. Um, but I'm all, yeah, I think this, this deep learning in the software that writes itself, I think that, that, that it's already available, you know, yeah. in, in, yeah. in many instances. Yeah. It's doing yeah. basic tasks yeah. now. Um, yeah. And that will just increase exponentially. But uh, Nick Benson, thank you for the question. Uh, how do we reconcile the use of technology to create abundance? within a digital space while the current digital is based on the scarcity model, basically the attention economy and, and time is finite. So I think, I think that's a very broad question on. Oh, it's a deep question. Abundance I'll mindset. Get, yeah. Yeah. I'll get Nick back. Cause that's a, that's a really deep question. And, and it goes to mindset. I mean, it, it has to start with mindset because, you know, in my view, corporates are, are um, promoting scarcity and, and, you know, secrecy and extreme competition. On the other hand, you look at Elon Musk, he's opened up all these patents for everybody to share and contribute to. So the, the, those are like worlds apart. Um, and until you have an abundance mindset uh, and you're open to that kind of approach and thinking, uh, it, you, you're, you're unlikely to uh, see the exponential possibilities as, as, you, as you termed it earlier. So now let's get into exponential organizations a bit. <clears throat> so exponential organizations um, were came from this book, Exponential Organizations by Salim Ishmael and, and Yuri van Geest. And um, they, they really are essentially the, the characteristics of exponential organizations. And we're gonna go into a bit more detail on this, but in summary, the characteristics of exponential organizations are fundamentally different to and opposite to linear traditional thinking. So in linear organizations, you have a top-down hierarchical uh, organization and structure, command and control. In exponential organizations, you have autonomy, you have social technologies where everybody can talk to anybody at any time. You know, you don't have to go through a hierarchy to, uh, Validate a decision. You know, if you if you at the bottom of the pile think that somebody's made a decision that could be better, you can go up the line with a with a WhatsApp chat and say, should we really be doing this, or perhaps we should try something different. Uh, open door policy, completely digital open door, to to put it that way. Um, they're driven by financial outcomes. The, the, the linear organizations, so very short, short termist, uh, quarter by quarter, drive the numbers, uh, almost don't care about the people, rather worry about the numbers and, the, and, and finances. Whereas exponential organizations have what's called a massive transformative purpose, and they're driven by dynamic dashboards that really give them, uh, expose to them what their customer base is, is doing, thinking, you know, and, and uh, how they need to adapt to that. So linear sequential thinking on the on the left hand side, and experimentation and autonomy on the right hand side. So learn and fail and iterate, um, build, measure, learn continuously. You know, lean, agile uh, kind of thinking. Innovation 
primarily comes from within in linear organizations. You know, they think the R&D department can have a few uh, experts in it, can have the best people in it, um, and, and that will provide for the innovation that you need. Whereas in exponential organizations, you know, look at it, look at an organ, look at a company like GitHub. It's leveraging all of the resources of the of the programmers out there and their smarts to to create value. Um, community and crowd staff on demand. So so you know, we'll go through some of these attributes in more detail. But innovation more from the outside and at the edges than within the organization. Strategic planning largely at a extrapolation from the past, which creates a linear view of things. <laughs> you know, the expectation that things will continue to, to grow at a linear kind of pace versus um, experimentation and exponentialities where, um, you, as you've seen in some of the graphs, things go through the roof. Risk tolerance versus experimentation, um, highly risk averse in, in typical corporates. Whereas, whereas failing is actually uh, praised and, and the learning that comes from it is promoted in exponential organizations. Process inflexibility. Um, so, you know, implement your favorite ERP with its standard processes and fit your organization to that. And that's how you work and you, you will not uh, do it any other way. <laughs> Versus autonomy and experimentation. Large numbers, numbers of staff versus you know staff on demand and leveraging the community and the crowd and leveraging algorithms and services on demand to uh, uh, sorry I'm going in the wrong way to um, get the exponentialities controls owns its own assets versus leveraged assets this thing of leveraged assets is massive and and we've seen it with COVID. Um, People are now cutting back on office space big time. You know, that all those leases and, and, and buildings that, that, that the, the corporates have traditionally owned are, are, are heading out the window pretty fast. And what's quite interesting is that even though Airbnb has taken a massive knock, um, they're still actually doing, I read an article the other day, that they're still actually doing better than the hotels. You know, the hotels have taken even a bigger knock uh, with, with the assets that they stuck with. And then strongly invested in the status quo versus, you know, adaptability and, and, and the change capability. So that's the quick sort of overview and, of exponential organizations. And yeah. Craig, let me, let me jump in there because actually that mm. was, for me, a perfect answer to Nick's question about mm. scarcity versus abundance. And this is the mindset. Because Indeed. I think, I, Indeed. I think uh, yeah. The, yeah. You know, if you are building or leading an organization, and you tend to the right side of this, then you know you you have bought into or you have an abundance mindset versus a scarcity yeah. mindset. And if Absolutely. you're building your product um, and your experience is based on the, on the EXO characteristics, um, by definition, um, you are leaning into abundance. So it's uh, hey, yeah. I, I just want to make that connection back to Nick's. Nick's yeah, question. no, good, good, good point. Thanks very much. Cool. So. Um, Let's go into these attributes in a little bit more detail. And this thing of a massive transformative purpose is absolutely fundamental to tapping into the abundance mindset and understanding the, you know, exponential possibilities. Uh, and you know, I've been through a couple of iterations of crafting M2Ps, both for myself and some of my companies and some of my clients. And it's not the, the easiest thing to do, but it's really about why the organization exists and fundamentally at the outset you know why the 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 founders or the or the, uh, the leaders of the organization find you know, how do they find their own why and their own purpose and then how does that translate and, and contribute to to the purpose of the organization but also how does it attract the um the the community to participate in the ecosystem as Per the Google example, as a as a as a case in point, or um, I mean, the other Google example is 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 the Google uh, guides. You know, people all over the world posting photos and you know, contributing to the content that Google needs um, to 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 make the ecosystem work. And rating, uh, you know, 
companies along the way, uh, restaurants along the way, etc. So, so really leveraging the community and actually building a tribe. That's that's what it what it comes down to. Um, Seth Godin wrote a nice book called Tribe that that really goes into some of the fundamentals of attracting a community that become a passionate tribe in the way that Apple has done. And then what is the target of the organization, but not in terms of the next quarter and the financials, more in terms of the moonshot, you know, more in terms of the North Star. What is it that you really want to achieve? So, you know, Google talked about the awesome the world of uh, information. Um, it's, it, it's something that you can easily understand that even your, your, your grandmother would understand. Um, to, to achieve this massive transformative purpose, which is a higher aspirational purpose of the organization. Mm. And it serves as a guiding principle when key decisions are made. You know, so if it if we're going to do something, um, does it uh, take us away from this purpose that we that we're striving to to uh, to do? So my uh, company is is at the moment Doing, doing an exercise that we're calling democratizing entrepreneurship. So how do we make entrepreneurship easier? How do we make it more accessible? We're really difficult. How do we make it easier for people to be um, financially included in finance, you know, financially inclusive on the one hand, and on the other hand, how do we actually improve economic development as a concept that is in, in, uh, encapsulated in the MTP democratizing entrepreneurship in Africa. Ted talks about ideas worth spreading you know, and, and look at how they've been able to leverage a community to expand the Ted brand massively um, without their own assets, etc. Hey, Craig, you, you chopped Question. up a little bit there. Yeah, well, yeah. you chopped, chopped up a little bit there, uh, but the, the, the democratizing entrepreneurship okay. in Africa, whose MTP is that? It's mine. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. Cause that, yeah. Cause, cause I was yeah, actually yeah, going to ask you what, yeah. what is yours. And then I, I, I thought yeah, I had yeah. remembered before yeah. that that's what it was. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, yeah. so yeah. democratizing entrepreneurship in Africa is the massive transformative purpose of your own company. So that, that Correct. piece was of my training of my training company. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I don't know if you've come across this concept of holacracy, um, but it's it's really the almost the complete opposite of hierarchy, command and control, um, and and it's a concept where you know you've got multidisciplinary teams. So if you think of a finance person and a and a coder, you know, and a developer, whatever, and a and a product manager multidisciplinary teams cross-functional working together to achieve a product outcome um, with the autonomy to work at, work it out experiment and, and drive it out it's a completely different notion to uh, um, the way linear organizations work and it's essential to transforming the organization holacracy is just one of those uh, different ways of work there, there are lots of others but they're similar in many in many respects so the Exo Canvas goes further than than the MTP. It has all of these um, elements to it, and and we're going to go into some of the detail on that. Uh, there's a nice overview from Salim, which again you can access through the YouTube channel. But really, the the point is that you need to be able to transform fast, and you need to be able to pursue changes that that increase velocity. You know, so so. We're not talking about transformation that takes years, months, or, or um, you know, even minutes in some cases. We're talking about responding to customers in seconds. Uh, so, so let's explore that a bit. And um, if you look at these organisations, they they are starting to do that. So, you know, Salesforce's Einstein, as an example, makes more than four billion business analytics predictions per day. Uh, th these numbers are astounding. Um, Google's translating 100 billion words a day. 
and and of course Tesla is we've we've spoken about already, but it's really overtaking um, all of the other organisations in this in this kind of space. And the secret is that's a, that's a far cry from the overnight batch processing that most organisations <laughs> exactly so, uh, exactly. Craig, Craig, uh, two things: OpenEXO, who you'll talk about in a bit. Um, in a minute, yeah, yeah. Up. Um, they're they're saying it's great to see us sharing. Um, and and Paul Isink yeah. has asked a question I think from two slides back. Um, is there a view, and I guess your view, on the future for a digitally enhanced mindset for the individual yeah. or collective? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean that goes back to the cyber kind of thinking, uh, yeah. I, I guess. But I, and it's and it's to your answer. Chris, where it's already it's already happening. I mean, we, we saw what happened with um, uh, the, the the U.S. elections, and <laughs> so there was definitely a digitally enhanced mindset happening there with Cambridge Analytics. You know, so yeah. <laughs> I think the answer is yes. Uh, watch this space and be careful. Oh, I even say that this thing is is digitally enhancing our lives and our mindset anyways because it's definitely influencing us um yeah so yeah. no cool cool question and it's um and, and of course yeah. there is embedded tech and in, in you know yeah. biotech and stuff like that but maybe out of the scope of this so yeah sorry you, you're so, back so, uh, to the yeah the so i'm just going to touch on demand a little bit so you know and it's the other side of the of the increased uh velocity of servicing is the velocity of demand and if you look at this uh, Amazon delivery um, belt, what, what's fascinating is that every single box has got different content in it. You know, in traditional supply chains, there was a there was a conveyor belt for each product. Amazon can can put these things together on one conveyor belt that are all destined to multiple destinations with a whole lot of different stuff in them. So fascinating. And, and to the point about about speed, you know, the airlines took 68 years, credit cards took 26 years, ATMs took 18 years, um, the internet took seven years, I'm not gonna go on, on all, all of these, Twitter took two years, and Candy Crush took four months to reach 50 million users. So this is the po exponential possibility that we've been talking about and, and that we need to be aware of and we need to be tapping into. Um, and even finance needs to change. So it needs to change from, you know, rigid and central to adaptive and distributed to micro-venturing, uh, not budgets that are centrally controlled, but, you know, more of a VC kind of mindset. And from building value out of building a brand with assets on the, on the balance sheet to customer value attribution in terms of understanding customer lifetime value and the cost to acquire the customer. So the modern metrics for... Um, customer value attribution. And it even goes as far as um, the World Economic Forum saying that our global financial systems are going to be completely different by 2030. So there's two videos on that. But we started to see how the unicorns have, as digital natives, grown up with the ability to um, have very few assets have a, a valuation of a billion dollars in, in like less than 10 years typically. Um, I'm not going to go into this one. This is just a, a latest uh, Financial Times top 100 companies prospering in, in the uh, through the through the pandemic. What's what's particularly interesting here is to see the industry sectors and types of businesses, and and most of them are e-commerce. Uh, there's Facebook. There's Alphabet. You know they they're digital. The ones that are really able to. I was surprised to see Audi there. The ones that are really able to adapt have have leveraged exponential tech features um, extensively. Was just the point I thought I'd make with that one. And then, of course, the capabilities that you need are completely different. <clears throat> and I'm aware of time, Chris. We, I, I didn't think this would take as long as it's taking, but we're all good. Um, so your capabilities really have to be adapted. You have to be able to fail fast, and you have to work based on insights um, rather than assumptions. So let's look at these attributes in a, in a bit more deal, detail. And the ones on the, on the left-hand side are 
called the scale attributes. You've, you've, seen, you've seen them already. We're going to go through each one in a little bit more detail. So staff on demand, and, and again, there's a video that, that where Salim goes into them in you know, much more with, with, with much more clarity than, than I can. He wrote the book. Um, but it really leverages external wor workers rather than owning employees. So, and he Craig, makes the Craig, point. Yeah. Craig, sorry, yeah. something's going yeah. massively wrong right now. With sound. I don't know what to do. Uh, is it sound? We are, it's nothing to do with you. We're hearing some uh, other guy from the global stage that uh, I'm blocked. Oh. Uh, uh, should, I that carry, should I carry on or? No, because they can't hear you over this, uh, this other guy. I've got this, I've got this guy screaming in my ears and apparently they can hear him as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just uh, getting, I'm getting messages so, that, hold on to that me. effect. I'm getting messages to that effect as well. I've got no other tabs open. Yeah, it could be somebody who's watching both and and bleeding over. No, it's it's it's. Hold on, I don't have any idea. Okay, I'm holding. <laughs> yeah, sorry, just hold on. Just just put your two streams in the. Okay. But at least it's now music. So we've got music now. So, but I have no idea where it's coming from. Uh, I don't know um, what's happening. All right, let me email global team. Sorry for this. It's apparently it's the global main stage that's bleeding over it's us. It's nice music. Yeah. It is digitally enhanced mindset. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shoot. Uh, okay. Uh, are you hearing this, Craig? I'm not hearing it, no. Okay. But apparently everybody that's on, you know, watching through Campus Party is hearing it. Okay, I sent a message to Central. Oh, now it's a lady. Uh, some people are saying it seems to be sorted. Is it sorted on your side, Chris? Okay, it is fixed. It's not fixed for me. I'm still hearing it. So why don't you keep going, okay. Craig? And okay, I'll, and I'll, I'll keep going. Minutes. Yeah. So yeah. So Salim made the point that the best experts and the best employees don't work for you. They work. They all work for your competition if you're not uh, leveraging staff on demand. So uh, that's probably one of the the, the bigger, uh, most important points about staff on demand. Community on crowd, I've, I've touched on it a bit a few times. So really leverage your community, leverage your customer base, you know, build a tribe um, and create value for the community rather than for the organization only. Um, so that's community. I'm going to go quite quickly because we, we are running out of time. Algorithms leverage automated functions, in, including machine learning and deep learning that we, as we've already touched on to get the insights about the customers and products and processes, what's working and what's not working, um, which tasks can we automate and, and which platforms can we leverage out there? You know, so GitHub is a classic example in the, in the software industry. Um, leveraged assets we've touched on quite a bit. So, don't build your own balance sheet. Move away from fixed costs to off balance sheet. Rent it. Uh, there was <laughs> there was a 
and I never, I won't go there. What processes can we outsource? And is there capacity lying around which we could repurpose? I mean, Amazon is the is a classic example of that, where you know they initially were building all of their own infrastructure, and then they decided to repurpose all of that infrastructure, and look at Amazon Web Services today. Um, engagement, so leverage outside interests through gamification, digital reputation systems, you know, incentivized prizes you know, to create the network effects and positive feedback loops. So that's engagement. And then if we move on to the ideas um, side of the of the framework, which is interfaces, dashboards, experimentation, autonomy, and social technologies. Interfaces, this is the, the ability of the organization to take all of that, all of those ex externalities and incorporate them into your understanding of what's happening with products and market um, through APIs. So how can we self-service? How can we service better through and and uh, ro you know ro robotic um, chat robots, etc. Is is a is a simple example. And then dashboards that give us the real-time information on employee metrics um, and and customer uh, satisfaction, etc. Very important. So measuring the right data and what we do with that data. Experiments we should talk about for hours. <laughs> there's a there's a fantastic book called The Right It by Alberto Savaya, where he takes you through developing a market engagement hypothesis and breaking that down into mini hypothesis and testing each mini hypothesis and gives you a nice um, method for validating the assumptions that you make about the market and the product and, and product market fit. So, you know, lean principles, make data-driven decisions. The data has to be gathered through experiments. Uh, Alberta calls it get your own data, Yoda, your own data about what you, the, the market you're trying to serve and, and the effects of the, of the product and the customer value attribution that, that, that arises from that. So you learn from those experiments and you continue to build success from that on that basis. Craig, looking at the time, mm. got three mm. minutes left. Mm. Um, mm. I'm almost done. Go. Autonomy. Um, so we've spoken about alacrity, that flat structure that allows self-organizing multiple disciplinary teams to operate effectively. And then social, just using social technologies to remove all the barriers to communication from the inside of the organization out. So uh, OpenEXO has, and, and uh, ex there's a, there's a follow-up book to exponential organizations called Exponential Transformation, which provides you with a 10-week sprint capability. Um, there, there would be a core stream and an edge stream. So you, the, the core stream is, is, is the initiatives that you can take having gone through an understanding of the industry and, and some of these exponential possibilities that we've gone through today, what can you do at the core of your organization to transform and how can you disrupt yourself from the edge? And you'll come up with a number of these um, uh, uh, initiatives to transform. So the organization's book is kind of the ingredients. The recipe is the exponential transformation book. That, that allows you to build these 10-week uh, sprint initiatives. And then, of course, there's the Open EXO community, which is the, the kitchen where you can get the cooks and the bottle washers and the cleaners and the helpers. So join us in the Open EXO community and get certified, um, leveraging the EXO model, the, the EXO transformation ecosystem. You can certify along the way, and uh, we can offer from through Open EXO transformation as a service um, with lots of media content and a real-time ecosystem to support you. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, Outstanding, Craig. I really appreciate it, and I would really urge people to go to OpenEXO to uh, learn more of the free basic certification, which is all the education. And please, um, in the notes on Campus Party, uh, Craig's email is there, and he would be delighted to uh, send you the... Um, the slides and the slides yeah. have all the videos embedded as well. So, uh, yeah.
Outstanding. And there's this there's this exo cert uh yeah. link if you're interested in the certifications great and cool. let me uh thank you very uh, much and, and maybe the, the the last comment uh, is is on the, on the chat it says this is a master class content craig uh, excellent and thank you and so i will repeat what they said on the chat um thank you so much thank for you. rocking in from south africa for the winter of south africa <laughs> um next up we have exponential leadership so what you know what yeah so so now that we've talked about the uh business models the mindset the attributes um we're going to get into uh, expert panel on exponential leadership um, also after that we're going to get into the, the the purpose uh canvas and all sorts of other uh um interesting things um including an example of an exponential organization uh later this afternoon called power peers. So we'll be back one, one moment.